charity at the CO Research Trust, and we're here for the final in our uh, lecture series. Um, I'm really, really pleased to welcome with me uh, today uh, Dr. Sophie Duggan, who <laughs> runs the Air Safe London project. Um, Sophie is, um, she's, uh, I think she's going to talk about her background in a, in a presentation, but um, Sophie is a, a, a lawyer who trained as a doctor and then in 2018 set up the Air Safe London project, which looked at CO. Um, and we've recently funded a small pilot, which has looked at the, the incidence of CO in uh, cars. Um, <clears throat> Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. Um, if you have any questions or queries, if you could put them in the in the chat at the bottom and at the end of uh, Sophie's presentation, we'll uh, invite you to to come into the call, so to speak, and ask those questions. Um, uh, I think that's probably enough for me. Um, there's quite a lot to get through this morning, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Sophie now. Thank you. Well, hello, and welcome to the final in the Carbon Monoxide Research Trust series of winter lectures. I'm Dr. Sophie Duggan, and I'll be talking to you today about my recent research project, the AirSafe study, and I'll be investigating carbon monoxide inside cars. What are we breathing? Well, a little bit about me just to start off with. I began my career in corporate law. I did graduate entry medicine 10 years after that at St George's University of London. I qualified in 2016 and I went straight into research, straight into carbon monoxide research um, with the support of the Carbon Monoxide Gas Safety Society um, and also later on with a grant, a research grant from the Carbon Monoxide Research Trust. I launched the Air Safe study in 2018. That ran until 2021. I'm planning to publish this year, and here is a preview of my findings. So just to take you through a brief outline of how the presentation is going to run today, I'm going to start off by looking at the evidence that's out there, that's out there already as to how much CO is in cars, what people have been breathing, and the evidence out there, the body of evidence out there to show what people have been breathing. Um, then I'm going to ask the question of how much is too much and share some of the results of the literature search I've done on that. Um, having done that, I will present my own findings, which very much reproduce what's already been known. Um, but the difference is my findings reproduce um, global studies done over the last 20 years um, in cars driven by ordinary motorists today in the UK. Um, and once I've set out those findings, I will discuss how to translate them into real change, how to make sure that people stop breathing low level carbon monoxide in their cars on a chronic basis, um, how to stop people from suffering the ill effects that, uh, that result as a consequence of that and how we can do it soon. We'll then move to Q&A. So let's get started. So, I first got involved with the issue of carbon monoxide in cars in 2013, uh, when we discovered as a family that our car had been leaking exhaust into the passenger cabin for several years, um, completely unknown to us. Um, it was only when the exhaust had been making a bit of a funny sound that we took it to the local garage. We were very lucky. We happened to have an excellent, really excellent local garage run by the kind of guy who still takes cars and motorbikes apart and puts them back together for the love of it, rather than a guy who just runs computer diagnostics. Um, and uh, he called me in and he said to me, has any member of your family been suffering from unexplained illness? Now I had to say yes to that because for some years while we'd been driving this car, my middle son, who's pictured there age two, he's 14 now, he was, he was much younger then. Um, my middle son had been suffering what in medicine are known as B symptoms. And for anybody non-medical in the audience, B symptoms are pretty frightening. They're a combination of drenching night sweats, weight loss, and swollen lymph nodes. His lymph nodes were swollen up really quite markedly in his neck. And our GP had told us to be prepared 
prepared for a diagnosis of lymphoma. Um, he'd been taken for a scan. Um, somewhat to our relief and surprise, the scan was found negative for lymphoma. The lymph nodes themselves were not cancerous um, to look at at any rate, which begged the question of what's making them swell? What's making him so poorly? And uh, anyway, going back to my conversation in the garage, uh, I said, yes, 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 some members of my family have been very unwell. And uh, I hadn't been feeling great either. In all fairness, I'd had some unexplained chest pain. I'd had some headaches. He took me outside to the yard and he said, well, I think this is your problem. And he showed me the catalytic converter of the car. And inside the cavity of what had been the catalytic converter, there was nothing but blocks of soot that had formed there over a long period of time. Of course, the presence of those blocks of soot had created an obstruction to the flow of exhaust that had caused back pressure on the system that had caused multiple little leaks to open up all along the system, all along the exhaust system. And we'd been breathing it for goodness knows how long. Now, the, the mechanic said to me that he saw cars coming in on a weekly basis with this kind of issue. Um, we got rid of the car, naturally enough, and uh, my son's symptoms disappeared, as did my ill health. Now, that's not medical proof that the car was causing his symptoms. Of course it's not. But nevertheless, the whole experience prompted me to ask, what are we breathing in our cars? So I had a look at the medical literature. Um, and it's pretty abundant. You can, for example, there's a meta-analysis done in 2007, a review of 17 studies, uh, the in-car average, in-cabin average rather, 10.5 ppm, above the levels experienced by cyclists, above the levels experienced by pedestrians in those studies. And of course, 10.5 ppm is above the level that a gas-safe engineer would consider safe in your kitchen or mine if he was called out to look at the boiler which is pretty worrying. Um, reflecting this, CO is regularly in the news. I don't know how many people here followed the Ford Explorer story. Policemen in Texas were exposed to carbon monoxide fumes, which entered the passenger cabin through leaks. Um, and as recently as 2021, a taxi driver in Melbourne received a pretty chunky payout um, after he suffered serious permanent brain damage, after he suffered a major heart attack, after he breathed exhaust fumes that were leaking from the exhaust system inside his, his taxi. So just briefly uh, to touch on exhaust leakage in sidecars, um, there's a diagram here. You can see many, many components that go together to form the exhaust system of a car. The exhaust fumes are under pressure all the way through. They're resonated here. Um, yep, they resonated here. What this, what this system, that, what this diagram doesn't show, of course, is the exhaust gas recirculation system. There's a very good paper from MIT uh, that suggests that that's a particular point of vulnerability. Um, it also doesn't show the coolant system, and it turns out that exhaust fumes can seep into your coolant as well. Um, this isn't really new news. Um, a, as long ago as 1981, a study was done of more than a thousand so-called sustained use vehicles. So that's that's vehicles that are used pretty much continuously for four hours or more. Vans, police cars, taxis, and each contained on average four to five points of exhaust intrusion. So now we have to ask ourselves, how much CO is too much CO? Here we have the CO molecule. Um, and the first thing to say really is that chronic low level carbon monoxide exposure is a separate clinical entity to acute high level CO exposure, um, which, which we'll all be familiar with. We've, we've all read the tragic stories. Some people here will have dealt with the survivors mm -hmm. of those incidents in large quantities. As we know, it's an asphyxiant. It can kill or produce lasting brain damage in a matter of hours, if not minutes. At low levels, it won't do that. However, what it will do is cause wide ranging multi organ damage using other pathways. It can, which I will go through in a moment, 
One is linked to the release of nitric oxide inside the body. Another is linked to the bonding between carbon monoxide and cytochrome C oxidase. There's a way of thinking about the effects of low level chronic carbon monoxide upon hypoxia, although it's not an acute short term asphyxiant. Hypoxia is still worth talking about. And lastly, it's important to identify or to talk about some of the vulnerable groups who are particularly affected by breathing carbon monoxide at low levels. Today, I'm going to look at pregnant women, children and the unborn. So we'll talk about the release of nitric oxide. So when you, when you breathe carbon monoxide, even at levels as low as five parts per million, that's not much. It causes a release of intracellular nitric oxide that comes out into your bloodstream that triggers a series of biochemical pathways which are in part immune, immune mediated. Um, and the end results are not good. They include atherosclerosis, cardiac arrhythmia, thrombosis, demyelination of the white matter of your brain. What you're effectively doing by breathing low levels of carbon monoxide, especially on a continuous basis, is lighting a slow burning fuse inside your body, which because it's immune mediated, will continue to activate even after you're out breathing fresh air, even after you've cleared all the carboxyhemoglobin from your system, long after any medical professional has given you a clean bill of health. It's deeply worrying. Now, the other thing that carbon monoxide does, besides trigger the release of nitric oxide, is it bonds to an enzyme called cytochrome C oxidase. That's this thing just sitting here. It's the last enzyme on the electron transport chain that sits inside your mitochondria. It's got a very simple job. It generates energy, takes glucose, passes it through a series of proton pumps, if you like, and out comes energy at the other end. So you can imagine what happens if you've got a dirty, great carbon monoxide molecule just sort of sitting there, getting in the way of the work of the mitochondria. Firstly, you have less energy. So your whole body is depleted of ATP, adenotriphosphate. That's the body's energy molecule. But the second thing that mitochondria do when they're stressed is they kick out loads of free radicals, oxidant species. Now, free radicals, are implicated in just about any disease process you'd care to name. Cancer, Parkinson's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, aging, premature aging, it, it, it's there. Um, so again, it's, you know, you're in the car, you're breathing low level carbon monoxide. It's, this is really, really not good news. I just wanna talk briefly about hypoxia. Um, I've got a little picture here of uh, an artery that's been narrowed and stiffened. Now, of course, it's the main vector of harm in acute CO exposure, we know that. Um, very hard to pinpoint the exact PPM, let alone carboxyhemoglobin level, at which permanent damage takes place. And I, I don't seek to do that here, I didn't seek to do that in the write-up of my study. But what I do point up is that having breathed low level carbon monoxide for some time, a body will have a lower threshold at which it can cope with hypoxia generally. Now that's for two reasons. Firstly, your blood vessels will have narrowed, they'll have stiffened, they'll have clogged up because of that nitric oxide triggered immune mediated pathway I went through earlier. And secondly, the binding of carbon monoxide to cytochrome C oxidase impairs your mitochondria from respiration to begin with. So your cells are primed to, to decompensate. So if there's a drop in oxygen levels for a completely different reason, for example, let's say you're asthmatic, you have an acute as asthma attack, it's much more likely to become acute severe in terms of its impact on the tissues in your body at least, because having been exposed to CO at low levels more or less every day for years, your cells are primed to decompensate. Now that's gonna be particularly a problem in your brain. Neural tissue is especially vulnerable to drops in oxygen levels. It's a very oxygen hungry organ. It can't adapt easily to a fall in oxygen because it can't do this metabolic switch 
that a lot of other cells in the body can do quite easily. And um, it's of a special concern in the light of this that transport and logistics workers have an increased risk of developing vascular dementia. Um, I've put the reference right up there. I would commend anybody who works in fleet, in logistics, in transport, or indeed in dementia, um, to have a read of that. That's, that's, that's really, really very worrying. So I'm gonna to touch briefly on vulnerable groups now, pregnant women, children, and the unborn. So pregnant women have an increased metabolic rate. I've already talked about how carbon monoxide is a mitochondrial stressor. Um, it promotes the depletion of your ATP levels. You kick out lots of free radicals when you breathe it in. And you won't be surprised to hear that oxidant species are linked to many, many negative outcomes, infertility, miscarriage, preeclampsia, intrauterine growth restriction, preterm labor, and more. Um, and also it's probably worth mentioning that nausea, which is a you know, textbook symptom of CO exposure, can easily be misread as morning sickness. Now children, likewise, have an increased metabolic rate and the vulnerability to CO that goes with this. CO accumulates faster in the body, certainly of neonates as well. All of us in our first year of life have persistent fetal hemoglobin, HBF, which has an even higher affinity for CO than regular hemoglobin does. Um, and all children, including adolescents, are undergoing very rapid brain growth and uh, neuronal editing. The brain is growing new tissue and then it's trimming it back down, growing it, trimming it back down until the brain has reached you know, the, the, the pattern that it's, it's supposed to reach. Um, now this, this process, as I'll go through briefly, is particularly vulnerable to disruption by CO. And children, of course, are less able to articulate their symptoms. Now in the unborn, the effects of CO are even worse. We've talked about the affinity between fetal hemoglobin and carbon monoxide, but of course, the unborn child has no lung function. Now, he carboxyhemoglobin leaves the body through exhalation. So this stuff is coming in faster, it's building up faster, and it's, it's, not, it's not exiting. Now, we know from tobacco studies that smoking is linked to all sorts of bad outcomes. But what we also know, of course, is that cigarettes don't just dose a pregnant woman with carbon monoxide, but with all kinds of other toxins. So any evidence from those studies is, is certainly of concern, but in terms of isolating the specific biochemical effects of CO on the unborn child, they're persuasive at best, I would say, which is why rodent studies are really interesting. And again, extremely worrying. Um, at quite low levels, five parts per million, again, what CO is capable of doing is disrupting pre-programmed apoptosis, this neuronal cell editing. And the way it does that is it comes in, as well as sitting on the cytochrome C oxidase enzyme in the mitochondria, CO molecules are also liable to sort of just perch on the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And what they do there is they inhibit the exit of a particular subunit which combines with two other subunits outside of the mitochondrion and forms something called the apoptosome. And the apoptosome is the cell editing tool, tool that ensures that the brain develops properly. And so rodents exposed to CO or after, you know, after they'd been born were shown to have quite substantial degrees of neuronal disorganization in their brains, including quite, you know, of, of quite, quite, quite serious note, um, a loss of GABAergic neurons. So that's neurons that generate something called gamma amino butyric acid. And being low in GABA or having, having in, you know, insufficient levels of GABA, GABA being generated in the brain it is linked to autism. It's linked to ADHD. So who knows? Could it be that the substantial burden that those two conditions place on the pediatric population in terms of public health might to some degree, to some degree at least, have their origin in a leaking exhaust pipe. So it's all pretty worrying. It's all pretty worrying. Uh, but as I've said, the data that we have 
the data that we already had by the time I learned about my car was very much dispersed around the world. Um, vehicle maintenance regimes vary hugely from country to country. If you're going to affect policy change in the UK, you need evidence about what people are breathing here in the UK. So that's why I did it. I recruited two cohorts of volunteers, non-smokers, one from my local area, Chesham and Amersham. Very easy, I just set up a little website, www.airsafe.london, you, you can have a look. Um, and also with the support of Southern Gas Networks through the Carbon Monoxide Research Trust, I ran another cohort in the early, in the first quarter of 2020, actually just before the lockdown as it happened. Um, and we put carbon monoxide data loggers in the cars of their, their fleet drivers. This was the data logger that we used. It was essential that we used something that the lay person could use without any complication, any issues, any fuss. People are busy. Uh, people haven't got time to faff about with laboratory grade kit. They just haven't. Um, people are very busy. Um, so, so, so we use these, these little things here. I've got a picture just here to give you an idea of size, just the same size as a transponder key. Inside there, is an electrochemical sensor, plugs into your iPhone or your, your, your smartphone. If you've got a wireless smartphone, you can use a lightning adapter and it runs on an app. The app zero calibrates the data logger every time it's plugged in. And the app also, once it had recorded and stored the data logs, enable when it was when it was working well sometimes the the email server was a little bit unreliable in certain models um but with certain models of phone that is um but when it was working well um it enabled users just to send, send emails straight off so pretty simple to operate pretty simple to operate a nice design i think i think a nice design so this was the method and um i put a drawing in here a drawing a graphic um of a car with groceries in it really just to stress just really to get across that this, this was a study of ordinary people using ordinary cars ordinary journeys in day-to-day -day use um the sampling rate was one one sample per 10 seconds and as i've said they were emailed direct from the phone using the app what I wanted to do was just to get a picture of what, what, what's happening out there, out there from day to day. Um, before I move to the results, it's probably a good idea to sound a slight note of caution on how we extrapolate um, my, my, my findings. This was very much a small scale pilot study. Um, there's also, of course, a potential sampling bias in that the self-referring cohort, the Chesham and Amersham people, may well have been prompted to respond to my call for volunteers because they were already worried about their cars. And as I've said, the technology is still in its very early stages of development. Um, you know, the app did need to be tweaked now and again. The sensor performed extremely well. It performed very well, cross-tested against the last car's CO300. So at times the app, um, for example, when we got very, very high readings, which we did, a few times the x-axis on the graph would go above the reference range or not the reference range above the sensitivity range of the sensor when that happened um i count the values at 999 parts per million uh, because that was the maximum range of the sensor and used them in calculations um but with that in mind here we go so here were my overall results um there were 27 drivers uh, 32 vehicles of various kinds, 251 data logs. I had some really excellent testers out there, really. You know, some people really stepped up. They were very impressive. Um, 13 vehicles had no CO in any journey, which was extremely good news. And actually somewhat surprising. I was expecting all cars to have a certain residual amount of CO just because of what's on the roads, just because of all the tailpipes on the roads. But, but it seems that CO in cars is actually completely avoidable, which is, you know, when you think about it, very good news. Um, of the cars had non-zero CO in at least one journey, in at least one data log. So let's look at the non-zero group. We've got something of a U-shaped distribution, I guess. 
Um, nine cars scored pretty low levels between zero and five. Um, just three were in between, between five and 50. But in seven cars, in seven cars, there was at least one reading above 50 parts per million CO. And what I'm gonna look at now are some of the more interesting readings that we got. So we'll begin here with a low level continuous leak. This is a Volkswagen Polo, a petrol model, 13 years old, pretty elderly car. Here it is with the windows open. Here it is with the windows closed. So what you can see here is, I mean, it's a pretty short data log, but there's a steady build of CO. And, and what I would really like to know is what happens to that line when the car drives for two hours, three hours, I don't know, from Hemel Hempstead to Leeds, let's say, um, with, with the windows closed. I just wonder, I just wonder how high those levels could get. Um, but it's pretty clear evidence that something's leaking from inside the car there. Now, three cars showed a very different, but also very interesting pattern of extremely elevated CO levels on ignition, which fell to almost zero as the catalytic converter warmed up and the car moved off. And um, at first, I thought, well, perhaps this is a calibration error on the part of the data logger. But then I thought, well, hang on, the data logger auto calibrates as soon as it's connected to the phone. Um, it, 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 by, the time, by the time a data log is, is run, recorded, auto calibrations already happened. So I could rule that out. And then it seemed to me that probably what we're dealing with here and also here, you'll see the x-axis runs a bit high there. Um, and also here, again, I cut the values off there, 999 parts per million. But it seems to me that what's happening probably is that there's a leak downstream of the catalytic converter. And as it warms up and as it scrubs CO from the exhaust gases, the passengers are no longer picking up CO, which doesn't mean there still isn't exhaust gas entering the car. You know, this, is, this is deeply worrying. It could be that the passengers in those cars were breathing very high levels of other toxic gases. There's been some excellent research done up in Edinburgh on the effects of particulates in diesel exhaust on people's health very much aligns with other findings, findings that you know, I found in my literature, literature search um, on the effects of CO at low levels, also promoting atherosclerosis at low levels. It's a, it's a toxic cocktail. It could be that the leaks didn't close up at this point. It's just that the, the CO was scrubbed from them. And I think an interesting angle in future studies of this kind would be, would be to test for other, other toxic gases as well as CO. But, but there we are. It was an interesting pattern. We picked it up in three cars. And uh, two cars I'm going to show you now have a different pattern, which is of CO levels accumulating and then kind of falling gradually, but, 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 but not massively. Um, this was a lady driving her car on the way to the shops. Really not brilliant. She was worried about headaches, um, had two small children. This is a car, on the other hand, that, oh, I should say, this car, this was the worst journey log we had in this car, but it had a lot of other journeys with a lot of CO. Whereas in this car, which has a slightly similar pattern, the interesting thing about this car was that in almost every other journey, there was hardly any CO at all, very unlike the Toyota. Um, now, I asked a little bit more about this journey, or you know, what, what was different about this journey? And the lady who owned this car said, well, I was driving uphill, traffic was very heavy, it was a cold day, and both sides of the road were very steeply embanked. Now, we know from previous studies that this is a classic trap, if you like, for clouds and clouds of CO. It's what one researcher terms a street canyon. Um, and it, it would appear, especially in the light that the other data logs from this car were so, so CO negative, really, for the most part, it would appear that what this car was doing was sucking in fumes from the car in front. Um, and had the driver had some way of knowing this, if she'd had some kind of onboard or wearable low level CO monitor, 
that would have protected her because even if she'd had the car checked out on MOT or on servicing and the exhaust had been found to be perfectly okay, which it probably was, on certain roads, clearly, she's still very vulnerable. Now, I'm going to take you through, just, just to close out my results, the two most alarming readings that I got, I would say. This was a lady who very kindly volunteered to test cars belonging to her father's secondhand car business. I don't quite know what he thought about that, um, but, but you know, it was immensely helpful of her. Um, Mini Cooper convertible, top up. Um, whenever she put her foot on the gas, she said, that's when she got these really quite scary spikes. So that car was withdrawn mm. from sale. It was sent off to the garage to be looked at. Um, but while she was doing these tests, a friend of hers, it turned out, had been to Stoke Mandeville Hospital with nausea, dizziness and headache, like very, very serious, very serious nausea, dizziness and headache. She'd been examined in A&E. Um, they'd made no diagnosis. They discharged her, um, saying she was stressed, probably overworked. Uh, she continued to feel absolutely awful. So the lady who did this test said to her friend, well, look, why don't you have a go with this carbon monoxide testing thing um, that I'm doing um, for, for, for this doctor who lives locally? You, you never know. Uh, the hospital didn't pick up on it, but, you know, still could be the case. So let's give it a go. And this is what we found. Again, capping the values off here. If you look at the printout, reading by reading, this baseline, you'll notice the first interval on the x-axis takes us from zero to 333. This baseline is in fact about 50 parts per million. So this lady's breathing 50 parts per million carbon monoxide continuously in her car with these enormous spikes, um, perhaps when she puts her foot on the gas, I don't know, in this case. Um, and she's feeling absolutely appalling. And in fact, she's felt pretty ill since she bought the car, got rid of the car after seeing these numbers and felt a lot better. And in view of the fact that the hospital had not realised or picked up on or asked any questions about carbon monoxide exposure, in view of the fact that she had textbook symptoms and in view of the fact that those symptoms went away, you could almost say, I don't know, did we save a life that night? Perhaps that's a bit too much to say, but, but nobody, nobody should be breathing 50 parts per million CO in their car all the time. Nobody should be. And, and nobody should be unable to learn that either by seeing a doctor or, or by any other means. You know, had I not been running my study in the vicinity that weekend, she would never, never have known. So here's a summary of findings. A substantial body of literature shows that CO can accumulate within vehicles. And I hope I've also shown today, or explained to you today, just how seriously harmful to health chronic low-level CO inhalation can be. Um, and again, I also hope I've shown that my study shows a significant proportion of cars in the UK may be maybe exposing their occupants to CO, partly because it comes in because of internal leaks or partly, as in the case of the Dacia Sandero, because it's sucking in CO from the tailpipes elsewhere on the road. Um, and, you know, I put a little worried Easter egg here because, you know, this really, really worries me, <laughs> um, especially as a, I suppose, yeah, I'm a survivor of CO exposure myself, as are my children. Um, it, this is this is immensely it's immensely worrying it's immensely worrying so where do we go from here well how many uk motorists could be affected um extrapolation as i've said especially from a little pilot study like mine with all of the issues that pilot studies tend to encounter novel technology small sample size risk of sampling bias and so on and so on Extrapolation is something that you should do with caution. Um, that said, the numbers are really not great. Um, doing the maths, we're looking at 23 million drivers in the UK today, plus their passengers, 
plus don't forget unborn passengers chronically breathing in low level CO with, with, with terrible effects on their health, terrible effects on their health, narrowing and stiffening their arteries, creating prothrombotic conditions in the bloodstream, contributing to cardiac ill health and demyelinating the brain in the long term. I mean, that, that's appalling. That's just an, an unacceptable. It's, an, it's a completely avoidable risk factor. I mean, one thing that my, my findings do show is that cars don't have to be CO positive. Remember, 13 out of the cars I tested had no CO in them at all. So this is a completely avoidable risk factor. And to set this in context, cardiovascular disease costs the NHS more than 7 billion a year. And when you add in the wider economic costs to society, you're looking at in excess of 15 billion pounds a year, which of course is why cutting cardiovascular deaths by 150,000 over the next 10 years is a headline milestone of the NHS long-term plan. And I would submit that anyone who is serious about doing this, anyone who's serious about achieving this kind, this kind of goal must take seriously the issue of what we are breathing in our cars. And what also needs to be taken seriously are the health inequalities here. Drivers belonging to lower income groups are much more likely to drive older cars. Um, from 2030, you'll only be able to buy older petrol and diesel cars. And it's, you know, it's pretty clear to me that a minority of people can afford to buy a nice new electric car. I mean, that would be lovely, wouldn't it, if we could all do that? We can't all do that. Um, this places lower income drivers at such a clear and increased risk of serious health inequalities, serious health inequalities. It's a ticking time bomb and a completely avoidable one. So what do we do? Well, I have three recommendations that I'd like to put to the audience. I've welcomed discussion of this. I want to see testing for carbon monoxide in the MOT. And really under statute, it's already required. It, it's not happening, but it should be. I mean, possibly drawing on my legal training a little bit here, reading out the Road Vehicles Construction and Use Regulations 1986, which is the statutory framework under which MOT testing takes place. A motor vehicle shall at all times be in such condition that no danger is caused or is likely to be caused to any person in or on the vehicle or trailer or on a road. OK, well, we know that chronic CO exposure is a danger to passengers. We know that. We also know, of course, that passengers who are made drowsy by breathing in CO are going to be a danger to other the road users. So under operation of statute, this needs to be happening. It needs to be happening now. But MOT test testing for CO levels, I would argue needs to happen for sort of more human reasons as well, which is that budgeting for non-mandatory CO checks will simply be out of reach for most families in the UK today. It'll be displaced by other priorities, increasingly so as the cost of living climbs and climbs. And what I want to share with you briefly are a couple of qualitative findings I had. I had the top two quotes there are from people who wanted to test their cars, but you know, took the test to get home, had a think about it, and returned it. And they said, look, we just we just can't afford to replace our car. Psychologically, we're better off not knowing. One lady who lives just down the road from me said, I was going to test. But then I realized how much doing repairs to the house is going to cost us this year. And we can't fix the house and fix the car. Well, you know, fair enough. Um, and even more worryingly than that, this last quote here, here actually comes from the chap who drove the VW Polo um, that I went through earlier with the readings that were high anyway, with the windows that were not high, but, but non-zero, with the windows open and that, you know, more or less doubled with the windows closed. And he said, well, I'd better hope that it'll be OK. No way can we afford a new car, not even now that I know this. Maybe if I drive with the windows open? Well, well, maybe. But without mandatory in-cabin air quality tests on the MOT, and you could test for other things, you could test for particulates, you could test for all, all kinds of pollutants. 
without mandatory in-cabin air quality tests. It's just not going to happen where it needs to happen most. Now, my second proposition is that we supply GPs with wearable CO detectors. You'll notice there's a picture here of um, a halter monitor, a uh, portable ECG, not a wearable CO detector. Now, the reason I put that here is I really want to get across to people that wearable diagnostic technology is nothing new. It's nothing new. People have been wearing ambulatory ECG monitors, I think, since the late 1960s. For GPs to have something in their diagnostic toolkit, if you like, that involves sending a patient home with a wearable is, is, is not novel. It's not novel. It's not complicated. Um, and of course, it's necessary because the half-life of COHB is approximately four hours on room air. You could be breathing CO in your car on your commute to work. You could make an appointment with a GP. You could be seen late that afternoon in afternoon surgery just around the corner from your work, by which time you've cleared all the COHB. Um, you'll be breathalyzed or have a blood draw and the GP will draw a false negative and will cross potential CO exposure from the list of, of, of diagnostic differentials, assuming it was even there in the first place. Um, that's very dangerous. The other thing that wearables would do, of course, is enable GPs to pinpoint the source of CO exposure. I mean, I hope today I've made clear just how dangerous an environment the car can be from the point of view of low level CO exposure, but it is by no means the only environment that can expose people to CO levels too low to cause an acute event, but far too high to be harmless. Um, if you've got a tray, if you're a GP and you've got an actual trace that's mapped against time that tells you that your patient who's suffering unexplained chest pains, let's say, and is feeling inexplicably tired, um, you can see that this patient is breathing elevated CO every afternoon between the hours of one o'clock and four o'clock maybe they're a teacher maybe they're teaching in a science lab which has got a slightly poorly maintained heating system right and you can say oh right what do you do at that time in the week um well, i can see that you're breathing co at that time that way not only do you diagnose the issue you can actually start you can equip the patient to tackle it at source it's it's almost it, it's it's a no-brainer really isn't it um and lastly, I would just briefly mention that introducing wearable CO detectors to the GP you know, arsenal, if you like, um, would be a huge resource saving on GP time. In 2016, actually, I conducted an audit of a GP surgery in Surrey. Um, I looked at 67 patients who presented um, describing themselves as being tired all the time over a three year period, over the previous three year period. And now on average, those patients represented five times and in 37 cases, there was no diagnosis made. Now, if there had been a CO detector introduced right after the first appointment, and if some of those patients, some of those patients had in fact been breathing low level CO, think of the appointment time that would have saved. It's this is this is simple technology and it's 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 well overdue introduction and it, it really needs to happen. And lastly, I would say I would say that besides introducing air quality testing to the MOT and giving GPs the means with which to detect low level CO exposure in their patients, I would say there is a case for developing consumer facing low level CO detectors. I mean, everybody can buy one of these and thank goodness, but these are not designed to pick up chronic low level CO exposure. That's not their job. They're there to prevent acute toxic inhalation and, and, and death. Uh, and that's what they do and they do a great job of that. Um, it's not their job. We need different technology. Um, and if you think about it, the home and the workplace, as I've already mentioned, they're high risk environments. We know that over 65s are more likely to be CA exposed in their homes. The studies show that. Um, nowadays, especially, they're definitely going to be keeping the windows closed to keep the heat in. Think of what you might be breathing if you're a carer going from home to home. Think of what you might be breathing. Um, and uh, just a, a, a wearable that, that you could purchase and put on, you know, like, like an Apple Watch. 
it, it would protect people. It would protect people. Likewise, the driver of the Dacia Sandero that I that I pointed out earlier. I mean, she probably had a perfectly okay exhaust. That car would probably have passed an in-cabin air quality check on on on, on MOT. Um, but but she would have been protected by a wearable, wouldn't she? So next steps. Well, the Carbon Monoxide Research Trust is planning an upscaled in-cabin testing programme, which is fantastic news. I'm seeking wider support, meanwhile, also for the issue with digital health champion, there may be. Um, and I would be very, very, very happy to contribute to discussion with any and all interested parties about this. You know, as I say, I've spent the better part of the last four years looking into this into some depth. I'm a resource. Um, contact me, talk to me. I'm, I'm really confident that if the right people talk to the right people and have the right data, we can absolutely solve this. We can fix this and, and we can do it now. We can do it now. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we'll move to Q&A.